Morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody today. Um, are there any announcements? Yes. Um, Irene Miller called yesterday and uh, to report that Albert Sobel is doing very well at rehabilitation in Gettysburg. And uh, so well that he probably will get out uh, in a week rather than uh, thought it would be January. Now be uh, this later this week should get uh, back home. Um, also, uh, tomorrow is Frank Valentine's birthday, right, Frank? And uh, Tuesday is Larry and Sue Claybowl's anniversary. Happy anniversary. 300 years. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, we'd like to have one of us to stay in church for the uh, Christmas Eve service and next week, but if anybody would really like theirs to take home, um, we do have them labeled. Um, if you remember what color, you can ask me and I can um, locate it for you. The church does look beautiful, thanks to all of you. Anyone else? Um, we have written a congratulations to Pastor Beth for her installation at Apple's, but unfortunately, Apple's has closed due to COVID. So um, it will be arranged at another date later day but we want to congratulate you anyway and we'll wait for that date and christmas eve services are christmas eve at 7 p.m and i believe we'll have the lighting of the candles now This morning we light four candles. O Holy One, we light this fourth candle and marvel at your desire to be one with us. Let its flame summon hearts grown cold into the warmth, warmth of a people living in the light of love. Fill our lives with love, making room there for friends and state and strangers, all who desire to know you, God with us, as we work for justice and peace in the service of hope. Sing out, my soul, sing of the holiness of God, who has delighted in humanity, lifted up the poor, satisfied the hungry, given voice to the silent, and grounded the oppressor. God has blessed the full belly with emptiness and given the gift of tears to those who have never wept. God has God desired the darkness of the womb and inhabited our flesh. Sing of the longing of God. Sing our soul. And our hymn will be a little town of Bethlehem, 178, in the blue hymn of all four verses. <laughs>
gracious God, send your messenger to us today with the word of grace. If we are fearful, move us to confidence. If we are weary, offer us rest. If we are empty, fill us with hope. We have been searching for you far away. Let us find you at home, in our midst, changing hearts and minds, urging us to join your work of love. We pray in the name of the one who is coming, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Come into our midst, Holy One, rider of the clouds of heaven, surprising the answer to heartfelt prayer. In whatever way you choose, come, shake us up, help us to find you at work in our lives, showing the way to make all things new. In Jesus' name we pray. Do not be afraid, said Gabriel, surprising Mary and confronting her with the decision of her life. Do not be afraid, God is with you. 2021 has confirmed many of us with life-changing circumstances and decisions. We know fear from the inside out. In this moment, ponder that fear. Name it if you can, at least to yourselves. Continue to ponder, and if you can, try to name where you may hear God calling. Do not be afraid. Our God, who has been with the people since the beginning, is with us now, offering grace that is more than we can ask or imagine. God's love frees us from the past and helps us move forward into a new future. Let us thank God with us, Emmanuel, for faithful love. The readings this week tell the beginnings of an almost too familiar story of incarnation. <clears throat> Second Samuel 7 reveals God longing to be among the people, at long last, at rest from their enemies. King David worries that the presence of God with Israel dwells in a temporary sh shelter. David wants to honor God with a more permanent tabernacle, but God's prophet Nathan challenges him, are you the one to build God a house? Since the time of Exodus, God has been content to move about with the people in their midst, in tent and shelter, intimately engaged with them as they make their precarious way in the world. God's desire is to plant the weary people in a place of safety with wise leadership and access to God's own presence. Although in another generation, Israel will build a temple with a space set apart for the Holy One, in this moment, God desires to live life on the ground with the people. David's descendants, however, will have a different kind of house, a dynasty formed from the family of the humble shepherd called into leadership by God. The Gospel of Luke tells the story of God again, seeking a dwelling place amidst the people in Mary's womb. Mary, who is part of a poor branch of David's house, will offer the Holy One shelter and nourishment to grow into the fullness of human life. One of Mary's ancient titles in the church is Theotokos, God-bearer. Her dialogue with the angel sets the stage for the Holy One to continue the direct and intimate involvement of the divine with humanity, incarnation as one of us. Divine love and presence becoming flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone. Her song of joy in the Magnificat, which we read last week, declares the promise of such love to change the world from within to become a place of justice and peace. Our first reading this morning comes from 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 through 11 and 16. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you do have in mind. For the Lord is with you. 
But that same night, the word of the Lord came to them. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people of Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more. As formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Our second reading is from Psalm 89, one through four and 19 through 26. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Then you spoke in a vision to your faithful one and said, I have set the crown on one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And our third reading is from Romans 16, verses 25 through 27. Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, 
and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin who was engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. He was of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. Pray with me a moment, please. Good and gracious God, with your advent to the people of the world, to the Gentiles and the Jews, help us to recognize your presence in our midst and to give joy and gladness, hallelujahs, and hark the herald angels to celebrate your coming. Amen. You know, courage is an interesting word. We hear that word often, especially when connected to people like firemen and policemen who put the well being of others before their own. There are soldiers for whom courage is the fact that they face the unknown every day, every mission. And you have people that protest against the inhumanities and the injustices in the world. Theirs is the courage of righteous indignation who understand that something is wrong and want to do something about it. And then there is the courage that it takes to be a parent 
or someone who works with people and children day in and day out. School children, the aged, the intellectually challenged. <coughs> Courage has a lot of different faces, but they're all necessary in order to get things done in the world. In Matthew, who isn't mentioned today, but whose version of the Christmas story we all know, there's the part where Joseph is contemplating quietly separating from Mary in the betrothal. He was counted as a righteous man. And he did not want Mary to suffer punishment because if it were found out that she were pregnant before she was married, things would go bad. People back then took betrothal as seriously as they did marriage. And if they had discovered about that pregnancy, they would have stoned her to death. Joseph obviously didn't want that to happen. So he was going to just kind of quietly take care of things and make sure that nobody really knew anything more than was absolutely necessary. He had thought about this for some time. And when he finally made up his mind, he continued on his way. But later that night in a dream, an angel appeared to him and said for him to accept Mary as his wife, that he should proceed with the marriage. The angel told him that he was to name the child Jesus because he would be the salvation of his people. This is the kind of courage we don't hear much about. <clears throat> the courage of a man who's been told to marry a woman <clears throat> who is to bear a son that is not his. And he is to give it a particular name and is to all intents and purposes to be the child's father. Also, this child will be the firstborn child in the family. And upon him will fall all the blessings and duties of the oldest male child. Add to this the idea that the child is the son of God as well as the firstborn son of Mary and Joseph. And you'll find that Joseph had a lot to consider. However, this is where faith comes in. Joseph was an observant Jewish man, which meant that he followed all the laws and ordinances of his faith. In taking Mary as his wife, after finding out she was pregnant, he is technically going against several guidelines and laws. However, when he dreamed of the angel appearing to him and telling him that Mary was pregnant by the Holy Spirit, that changed things a bit. The angel in his appearance addressed Joseph as a descendant of David, thus fulfilling the prophecies that he, the Emmanuel, God with us, would come from the stump of Jesse, of David's royal lineage. Stop and think about this just a sec. Gentlemen, can you imagine being in Joseph's situation? First, he finds out his betrothed is pregnant. Second, it's not his child. Third, she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And on top of all that, the child will be a boy to be named Jesus or Emmanuel, God with us. The child will end up being Joseph's firstborn with all the benefits and responsibilities of being his father's heir. He will also be heir to the throne of heaven. 
kind of makes you stop and think about how Joseph must have been feeling. He was a quiet man. We don't necessarily hear a lot about him. But when you stop and think about what that just must have presented him with, wow. I mean, I can just only imagine that he woke up from that dream, sat up, quite possibly put his head in his hands and just sat there thinking, what have I gotten myself into? <clears throat> it's obvious that he cared about Mary based on the care he was taking when he thought quietly about ending the betrothal to save her from disgrace. Now he's told to proceed with the marriage and being an obedient man, he does so fairly quickly. These family dynamics kind of remind you a lot of what we have going on today. Many families are blended with stepchildren on both sides. There are oftentimes family friends or friends of the children who end up needing a home to live with people who are not their biological families. While this is fairly commonplace in our society, it wasn't common at all during Jesus' time. Family was everything to these people. They counted their lineage through their family. They made wedding arrangements based on family connections. And the temple or local synagogue kept track of marriages and deaths so that when people married, they did not marry too closely or far enough apart that things like land and other valuable assets were lost from the family. They also had to keep track of marriages and deaths so that if a man died with no heir, the practice of leveret marriage could be enacted. This is where the man's brothers or nearest known relatives would marry the widow so they could raise up heirs for the deceased men so the family would not disappear from the roles of the tribe or clan. So for Joseph to be told that his firstborn son is the son of the Holy Spirit, and that he has to name him Jesus, which wouldn't have been a usual name in anybody's family, by the way, and that she, he should basically raise him as his own child, in the context of what I just shared with you, this had to be weighing very heavily on his mind. If he wasn't shaking his head a bit, he missed an excellent opportunity. And yet, even in the face of the oddity of what he had just dreamed and you know, the lack of understanding that he probably had, he did not rebel against the instructions. We don't hear of him complaining. Instead, he does what he's told. He marries Mary and takes her to wife. And when the child is born, he names him Jesus. This is a different kind of courage. This is walking into the unknown and trusting God to help you make it through. This is having the courage to take a child, not even yours from birth, and raise him according to the laws and statutes of the Torah and making sure that the child has all the education that his heritage requires. This is also making sure that the child is raised to understand what faith and duty means in the context of the Jewish family and the Jewish people. This is a monumental job for both parents, but in different ways. For Joseph, it means showing an example of what an observant Jewish observing Jewish man should be, the kind of father one should be, and how those things are important to who you are as a person. Jesus would have learned these things from his father's example and would have, re would have replicated them in dealing with ordinary everyday people in his ministry. He would have taken from his heavenly father the idea of salvation and the concept of the kingdom of heaven drawing near. While Jesus' heavenly heritage gave him the gift of salvation, his earthly father gave him the gift of understanding humanity. 
Without these gifts from both fathers, Jesus would not have been who he was. Without the courage of Joseph to move forward, to accept his assignment, if you will, and to raise Jesus as a practicing Jewish man, Jesus would not have been able to be a son of David. In the end, the courage that Joseph had and the courage that it took for Joseph to fulfill his instructions from the angel helped Jesus to become who he was, the Son of God and also the Son of Man. Amen. In struggle and in joy, God is faithful to us. We bring forth our offerings, our tithes, treasures, and leased coins to demonstrate our faithfulness to God. You'll find the offering plate at the rear of the sanctuary to place your offerings. accept these gifts of our hearts and hands. May they be multiplied and magnified in the living presence of Christ in the world. Amen. Good and gracious God, we come to you today eager to celebrate your birth, eager to share that celebration with one another in the form of family time and parties and presents and Christmas Eve services and all those things that we love so much. Help us also to be aware at this time of those 
who are the least of these, the poor, the hungry, the lonely. Help us to remember them that at this festive season of the year, that no one should be alone or lonely, and no one should be without a visitor, and we should be welcoming all those who are your children. Help us to be supportive, help us to invite these people, help us to go to them when they cannot come to us. And let us share the things that we have that make Christmas a celebration of the one who is to come. Be with those who are sick, those who may be beyond sick and maybe dying. Be with those who are in government. And be with all those children who may not have a Christmas that they would want to remember. Hold them close in your loving arms and help them to know that you are with them. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is It Came Upon Midnight Clear, number 197, the blue hymnal, all the verses. Oh.
Let us go forth without fear, creating in our lives a space for the one who longs to dwell with us, to share our lives and bless our world, and lead us into the kingdom of justice and peace. Thank you. 